Joining me now in studio is Joel Pollack, political commentator and senior editor at large at Breitbart News. He is also the author of the new book out later this month called See No Evil, The 19 Hard Truths the left can't handle. Joel, we're thrilled to have you in the studio today. Thanks for joining us. It's good to be back here. You know, a lot has been made. We've got a lot of ground to cover, but we want to start with the Brexit vote. The ascendancy of Theresa May just yesterday as Britain's second female prime minister. What might they signal with this new prime minister as the eventual outcome of the U.S. presidential contest here in the U.S.? Well, it's hard to know, but it's clear that on both sides of the Atlantic, voters are moving in the direction of national sovereignty. People want to feel like they have control over what's happening in their own country, over what's happening in their lives. And for various reasons, people feel that they don't have any control, whether economic or political. And I think that there could be a reflection of that vote in England or in Britain uh, here in the United States. Now, uh, on the other side, of course, Hillary Clinton supporters would say, well, they have a female prime minister. That's also the way things might go in the U.S. Uh, people might decide they're ready uh, to, to have a woman lead the United States. We haven't had any female presidents. They're on their second female prime minister. But I think the movement on both sides is really towards nationalism, if I can put it that way, or at least towards uh, sovereignty, self-determination, away from transnational institutions, away from multinational cooperation, which worried some people at first. On the other hand, as the Brexit campaigners pointed out, there's no reason Britain can't have good or better relations with other countries once it's making more of its own policies. In fact, policies that it makes when it's more independent might have more staying power because they'll have greater popular legitimacy. So Trump wants to take us in the same direction policy-wise. Clinton might take us in the same direction gender-wise. It's hard to know. But certainly the theme of sovereignty is, is very powerful, not just in Britain, but here as well. Well, and you spoke about the relationships. What does this mean, Brexit and the new prime minister overall, for the U.S.-U.K. relations? We've always had this special relationship between our two countries. What is this going to mean going forward? I think the relationship will remain fine. I think President Obama has lost a personal ally in David Cameron. The two of them were often very buddy-buddy, going to basketball games together and that sort of thing. Uh, Obama's support tends to be the kiss of death for foreign leaders. But uh, David Cameron wasn't the first, won't be the last. And I think despite the decline in relationships between governments, I think the relationships between people and countries are very strong. There are many Americans who take heart from Brexit, not just Trump supporters, but on the left you've got Bernie Sanders supporters who want to see the United States exert different kinds of policies when it comes to free trade or to NATO and military engagements around the world. So I think that there will be some turbulence, maybe politically, just for the last few months of Obama's presidency. But overall, I think the special relationship will remain that. And you saw Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump asserting that they would maintain very strong relationships with Britain, regardless of the Brexit vote and in the aftermath. Well, more broadly even, in Europe's rising tide of their right-wing populism, um, you, you touched a bit about the Donald Trump supporters as well as a Bernie Sanders supporter really seeing the light of Brexit. But what is this right-wing populism really going to have an impact in the U.S. elections come November? I think it's important to distinguish between right-wing populism of the sort that's been bubbling up in various European countries now for the past couple of decades and that has already won elections in certain places, uh, won a number of seats in parliaments around continental Europe, and which in some ways represents a throwback to a bad kind of nationalism, uh, harking back to the mid-20th century. I think there are some parties that have positions that should be concerning to anybody. I, I think what's happening in Brexit and what's happening with the Trump movement here is quite different. I think that uh, Mr. Trump is not really a historical or traditional conservative, as many conservatives will be very quick to inform you. He's not really coming from that world of, of right-wing populism. He's a populist, but really more of a centrist populist. And I, I think for that reason, he's attracting a lot of people who normally vote Democratic. He has provided the Republicans with that elusive cross-party vote with those Reagan Democrats who had lost interest in politics for many years. And while there are some on the right who have views that are very far to the right who support Donald Trump, I think that's a minority of the Trump coalition. So I, I don't think he's in the same category. And I also would say the same about Brexit. I think 
there are people uh, from the center who supported Brexit. In fact, there were towns, industrial centers in Britain, with large labor contingent, contingencies that, that voted for Brexit and voted with the Tories uh, who, who were in favor, actually the Tory politicians were in favor of staying in the EU, but for those Tories who were leading the Brexit charge along with the UK Independence Party. Um, so you're seeing a kind of appeal across political lines with some of these themes that have nothing to do with left or right, but really more to do with sovereignty and independence. So with the rise of the sovereignty and independence and Donald Trump in the U.S., will they see this as being beneficial to Russians, Vladimir Putin? That's a very good question. I mean, Russia was certainly happy to see the Brexit vote because Russia's strategy in Europe is to divide Europe even further. Russia doesn't want a united Europe. They don't want NATO on their doorstep. They want to disrupt Western alliances as far as possible. Trump has been friendlier to Russia than many other conservatives have been. At the same time, Hillary Clinton has possibly the most pro-Russia record of any politician. She masterminded the Russia reset, which turned out very badly when she was Secretary of State, and probably her uh, top failure as Secretary of State after Libya. So it's hard to see how Russia will change its strategy to the United States going forward. I think whoever's in office, they will try to disrupt and, and distract. Uh, Putin has been friendlier to Trump because Trump's been making some friendlier noises mm -hmm. toward Russia. Well, and, and you're right about that. Donald Trump has raised eyebrows with his praise of Putin, but he's also praised Saddam Hussein, even Kim Jong-un. Thoughts on his seemingly soft spot for autocratic and authoritarian personalities. Do you find that worrying in the Breitbart community and beyond here in the U.S.? <laughs> well, Trump's approach to history with regard to Saddam Hussein is somewhat revisionist. So I don't really take his comments on Saddam that seriously. I, I don't think he was a vocal opponent of the war that he pretends to be now. I think a lot of that is just rhetoric. The left actually seems to have a softer spot historically for dictators. I mean, Jimmy Carter, in his presidency and post-presidency, has almost never met a dictator he didn't like. And Hillary Clinton uh, was very, very friendly towards the Assad regime in Syria. Uh, John Kerry and, and his wife having dinner with, with Assad and his wife. Uh, the, the democratic approach under George Bush was to be friendly to dictators because they wanted to contrast diplomacy with Bush's approach, which was, which was more confrontational. Uh, neither Clinton nor Trump are really on board with the pro-democracy agenda of George W. Bush, which had its deep flaws and worked out uh, not as well as the Bush people would have liked, but at least had some kind of moral component to it. You can argue that that moral component is not really appropriate in international affairs, and that's a very strong argument these days. But I think Hillary and Trump both have a record of trying to uh, coddle foreign leaders, even if they don't agree with them. And right now, the American public seems to be on their side. Well, it'll be interesting because next week at the Republican National Convention, we will see this Trump skill, to whatever degree that will end up being, on stage in Cleveland, Ohio. What is your assessment of the Trump campaign vis-a-vis -vis the GOP and the country overall? There's still many movements saying that they're going to be there at Cleveland protesting against Trump. Trump has shown his skill in very different ways. What do you think that skill will be on stage next week? Well, you know, when I think of Trump on stage, I think of... WWE and wrestling chairs, you know, <laughs> smashed over heads and things like that. But it's going to be entertaining. Uh, right now, Trump and Clinton are tied in several swing states as we sit here. They're actually even in Ohio, where the where convention will be. And Cleveland is basically running out of hotel rooms. It's, it's not got the capacity for this convention, but the reason the Republicans chose to have their convention there was to appeal to Ohio voters. Mm -hmm. And Trump's and yet also, their governor is not even going to come to the Right. It, 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 it's going to be a free-for-all. I was joking with my colleagues that I should buy a Cleveland Browns football helmet just to wear as I <laughs> enter the venue every day. Uh, and we're sort of splitting our coverage between people inside talking to politicians and people outside on the street talking to police and protesters, you know, and ducking the rocks and bottles and tear gas or whatever. It, it is going to be crazy. And hopefully we can keep a lid on the, the violence. I think the country's seen a bit too much of that lately. But I think you'll see some of the same in, in Philadelphia. I mean, the Philadelphia... Uh, union at the airport has just announced that they're going on strike during the Philadelphia Democratic National Convention. So good luck getting there and getting there with your bags. I mean, we're going to see chaos, I think, at both parties' conventions because there's a great deal of unrest in the country and disquiet with the respective establishments of both political parties. So it's going to be interesting, and I hope we all survive. <laughs> Uh, moving on to the vice presidential pick, which is sometimes the most exciting part of a convention. We know who the president's going to be. We can wonder, especially about Trump, what he's going to sound like and act like on that big stage, that platform on the world stage where everyone will be watching. But it's highly suspected that in the next few days, possibly tomorrow, we will hear who he picks as his vice presidential candidate running mate. 
Joel, any idea who that's going to be? I hear rumors that Kanye West is making his way to <laughs> he's, Cleveland. He's, he's got the T-shirt made up, the bumper stickers, yeah. ready to go. Well, you know, he's a good candidate because he offers a contrast to Trump. Trump can say, see, I'm not as crazy as this guy. Um, no, it looks like it could be Mike Pence of Indiana. Trump's been hinting all along that he's going to choose a seasoned politician, maybe a governor. He needs somebody, I think, with a history of uh, service in government, with some kind of uh, anchor on policy. Conservatives will be very happy with Pence. Pence is interesting because he endorsed Ted Cruz in the Indiana primary. Mm -hmm. So uh, that'll be seen as a unity pick, a sort of appeal to Cruz uh, supporters. Who knows where it'll end up going? I, I think Pence would be a good pick. I don't think it's going to matter much. I think the contrast between the two personalities at the top of the ticket is going to be what voters are looking at, Hillary versus Donald. And we'll see. And I, I don't know who Hillary's going to pick either. I don't think Bernie Sanders is interested at all in the job. Uh, I'm not sure what he's interested in, actually, because he seemed to throw in the towel rather quickly earlier this week. But we'll see. I think Pence would be good. Uh, there's a few other names running that I think would be great. But, you know, he could surprise us. I mean, this is Donald Trump. He doesn't play by the rules. Right, and I think that's why everybody's looking so closely at his VP pick. Is it going to be the sensible one to balance it out, or is it going to be somebody out there as the bulldog to right. uh, to rival him? But either way, Joel, we know that you'll be watching it. And we just want to, again, say congratulations on your new book out later this month is See No Evil, The 19 Hard Truths the Left Can't Handle.